Hi, we're back with Mike Posner. In our last segment, we did an overview of attentional research in his career. And in this segment, we'll discuss a little bit more the development of different techniques used in cognitive neuroscience. Work on attention began, of course, with purely behavioral methods. And those could involve everything from questionnaires, subjective reports of one state, to studies using reaction time or percent correct to measure, let's say, the number of items that you could recall after a single glance or how quickly you could assimilate a single bit of information. And most of the work uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, centered around these behavioral methods. There were some physiological methods as well. For example, it was common to record from scalp electrodes the electroencephalogram, and also one could average those scalp electrode activity by presenting the same signal or a class of signals over and over again and getting the so-called event-related potential. So those methods were all available in the 60s and 70s. In the late 70s, there was added a new method of recording from individual neurons, of course not in human beings generally, although some uh, of this recording was done in neurosurgery patients, but uh, mostly from uh, non-human primates. And then, uh, of course, in the late 80s, neuroimaging really began with the hemodynamic measures. So first we had positron emission tomography, which uh, allowed uh, one to look at blood flow in particular areas of the brain when the uh, alive uh, human being practiced some particular skill. So, for example, uh, one of our earliest studies presented a visual or auditory word and tried to isolate the different operations that were involved in reading the word, that is, synthesizing the letters into a unit, getting the word name, getting the meaning, and so on. And uh, positron emission tomography was a bit cumbersome for a number of ways. It involved injecting a radioactive nuclide, although a relatively small amount of radiation. Radiation isn't generally good for you. And uh, so you could only use this technique once every six months on a given subject. Uh, and of course, you didn't really want to do it unless it was a very important question, the answer to which could be uh, useful for humans. For example, our original language studies, we thought of their utility being in guiding neurosurgery to avoid the language areas. And in fact, I think that has been a, a useful uh, contribution of that work. But not very long thereafter, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging came. That method uh, doesn't exactly use blood flow. It uses the change in hemoglobin in red cells that occur when, um, uh, when blood flow is changed in a given area. And uh, since hemoglobin is paramagnetic, it can be sensed in a powerful magnetic field. And one can localize now to about a cubic millimeter or less the activity that occurs, uh, the neurons that are active in a given task. And of course, that method has opened up, uh, because it's completely non-invasive, it's opened up uh, running the same person multiple times, so one can look at individual differences between people. Uh, the big discovery from positron emission tomography was you could average across people, even for higher mental processes. But of course, there was a fairly good blur circle, and now you can see that maybe the individuals aren't using exactly the same circuitry. Yeah, I know that's still kind of an issue, is trying to decide if, if you're truly getting a good picture when you're averaging over brains, when really your brain structure is, is very different between individuals. Yes, and uh, of course you can get a story for an individual now using fMRI and us using his own brain. And then you can see whether, it's, uh, whether the individual difference in circuitry is resolved when you look at the difference in anatomy that's present in those different brains. So those are tractable questions. They wouldn't be tractable without having fMRI as a method to, uh, to resolve them. 
And of course, uh, now uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation has allowed us to manipulate particular areas of the brain uh, to, put, to, to essentially present a transient lesion by uh, uh, stimulating over some particular area, you can make you, that area sort of non-functional during, during the stimulation. And uh, that's like knocking out an area, like a transient lesion. And that's very important because fMRI gives you a set of areas that are activated by a given task, but it doesn't tell you whether they're all necessary or not. Now how does that knock one out? Then you can see whether that it's that it was absolutely necessary because they can't, let's say, perform that particular task anymore. Um, how is transcranial magnetic stimulation used? Like, how does it create this artificial lesion? Uh, well, it does it by stimulating an area, and therefore, you might say, scrambling the signals that would normally come from that area. So you actually. In a sense, it's a little bit like a, a very powerful stimulus that takes away the normal functioning of that area. And uh, there's another new tool that I consider a new tool, although it uses an old methodology. I mentioned uh, ele recording electrical activity from outside this, from the scalp, or you can also record magnetic uh, activity from outside the head. Now, that's been an old methodology in the sense that we've known about that electrical activity for almost uh, 80 years. But once you can't really go from a set of electrodes that are active on the scalp to say where in the brain it came from. But if you know where in the brain it comes from, from fMRI or other neuroimaging methods, then you can use algorithms to predict what the distribution should be on the scalp. And that allows you to go to use EEG, which gives you very rapid uh, responses, not as slow as the hemodynamic responses, which depend upon the uh, change in, in vasculature, change in the, in the veins and so on. The EEG allows you to get actually the activity of neurons in real time of course, not one neuron, many neurons. And once you can tell where that activity comes from, then you have both a time course and, uh, and as well uh, a localization. Moreover, you can use both fMRI and EEG to trace out the activity, the connectivity between different areas, functional connectivity, by looking at the correlated activity in remote electrodes by EEG or remote areas of the fMRI signal. And more recently, it's been possible actually to trace out the physical connections by using diffusion tensor imaging. When uh, water diffuses, it diffuses along the axons. So that can be sensed from a magnetic resonance imager with a slightly different signal than is usually used for uh, getting uh, gray matter activity. And so one can then trace the white matter and uh, actually look at the physical connections and relate them to the functional connectivity that one finds. So network tracing is a very big uh, approach to uh, cognitive neuroscience now expected to get much stronger in future years. So now we're talking about actually being able to map the interconnections between these associated brain areas and maybe proving some of the theories correct. Yes, I think both the, the being able to look at the full connectivity and also to be able to go in and knock out one node by, uh, by TMS gives you a pretty strong toolkit. There could be problems, however, in uh, uh, because even a functional MRI with pretty, pretty precise localization, cubic millimeter, that's still many thousands of cells. In general, in my view, that really hasn't mattered much for psychological theory. But uh, in the last uh, year or so, I had to change my mind completely about that because we've come to understand the way in which cells behave in the frontal eye fields, and it turned out to be a, 
amazing revelation. If you looked at functional MRI, the frontal eye fields are an important part of the orienting network, and it doesn't really matter whether you shift attention from location to location covertly, like in a visual search test where your eyes are fixed, or whether you make saccades. So the idea was, well, maybe attention was slaved on saccades, and uh, in fact, uh, it was really just a matter of suppressing the actual movement, but the mechanism of attention was exactly the same as the mechanism of the saccades. And as far as fMRI went, that seemed to fit the data great. Then people began to record from cells, and they found that within the fMRI blur circle, there are really two populations of cells, quite distinct. One population, which carries, which is active before saccades, and a different population, which is active when you're uh, searching without any movement at all. And uh, that work, which is carried out in uh, primates, not human, non-human primates, with cellular recording, has shown that, you know, we just have to be able to look within the MRI blur circle in some cases to, in order to disentangle what's actually going on. And I say that was a surprise to me. I didn't think we were going to have to do that. But uh, it does seem uh, required by this work. Now that you know that there are two population of cells, it could be that a very precise MRI image, knowing that fact, could separate those two populations of cells because their central tendency almost per, almost must be different. I mean, you wouldn't expect them to be exactly coincident. And um, that will be an interesting question. But of course, you wouldn't know to look if you hadn't done these cellular studies. And do you think that fMRI will actually be capable of, of finding these smaller, more detailed distinctions? I, I think so, once they're known. But whether it will be fa capable of discovering them, that's another question. And uh, this is uh, going to be very important, for example, within <clears throat> the anterior cingulate, in which there are many different types of cells which are intermixed. As you might suspect, if it, you're going to have a structure that's going to be involved in self-control or self-regulation, it's got to have a lot of information. For example, it has to know about reward and punishment. It has to know uh, about pain. And uh, these are all things that have been discovered in the uh, anterior cingulate. And usually people write papers saying, well, it's a pain center. It's a, it's a center for uh, reward or some and so on. But uh, I think now we know we have to have a higher level concept in which this information is synthesized and allows certain control operations to take place. Okay. So I know a lot of researchers um, usually just stick with one type of, of um, study, like they'll either use fMRI or they'll use EEG or they'll use this or that. So it sounds like you're thinking that researchers are really going to have to do a lot more of these combination studies where you use one to get this idea and one to get this other idea. So well, you know from home improvement that if you always use a screwdriver and you never have any other tool, you won't be very effective. So we have a toolkit now, and uh, it may mean collaboration between different people. That is not, no one person necessarily has to know everything. But uh, I think once you have a toolkit, you have to apply the right combination of tools to do the job and develop the theory. And we're positioned to do that now. And uh, that means uh, these methods and also the t selection of appropriate tasks that really allow you to use the method effectively. All right, so that's the future of uh, I think this is a, this definitely is uh, what n students need to be aware of in this I think why graduate school and postdoctoral work is more important uh, because although you don't necessarily need to know a everything about using every tool, you kind of have to know what the range of tools are in order to know how to select them to solve your question. So in the future, I'm talking about this toolkit that you're speaking of, um, what kind of tools would you like to have down the road? Well, of course, one would like to have tools that allow you to measure the activity of single cells non-invasively. This would be very nice. I have no idea how you could do this. But one of the really exciting things about neuroimaging is that it is attractive, attracted into the general field of 
psychology, I would call it, or brain science, whatever you want to call it. People who skills in physics or engineering allow them to develop tools. And so uh, perhaps we will have tools that could even uh, solve this problem of looking very precisely at individual cells. Also, it would be very nice to know the expression of different genes within different parts of the brain non-invasively. So we could look at how gene expression occurs, let's say, in the anterior cingulate uh, in relationship to tasks or changes in life and so on. All right. Well, thank you very much for your discussion on different techniques in neuroscience.